How much longer are we going to have to wait here? Trixie whined. At least until the army manages to get closer to Eldrathalus, answered Crivax, not for the first time. It'll probably take them at least a few more hours. We should be there fighting with the rest of them instead of staying here at the camp, Virisa complained sullenly, drawing a round of agreement from the other high elves surrounding them. Our role is just as important as any other, my love, Ronin soothed his wife. Perhaps even more so. If we can assist Krivax in successfully completing his mission, then we'll be in a much better place to handle these monsters. A round of dissatisfied grumbling passed through the camp, but it soon faded away. They accepted the truth of Ronin's words, even if it was unsatisfying to be forced to sit back while other people were fighting. Seeing that the latest round of complaints was over, Krivax turned his attention back to the large scrying crystal that had been set up in the center of the Alliance camp. Watching the battlefield from a bird's eye view offered Krivax a gruesome perspective of the ongoing war. Krivax knew that seeing so many people die against the primals should have filled him with a combination of sorrow and horror, like similar scenes did during the Second War. However, those feelings were somewhat muted due to him growing accustomed to the violence of Azeroth, and were easily overshadowed by a stronger feeling of accomplishment. From the moment that he had reincarnated into this world, it had been his goal to push everyone to work together against the forces that threatened to destroy Azeroth. Not only because it was simply the right thing to do, but because it was the best way to ensure his own survival. Now, after the Night Elves had agreed to cooperate with the Alliance, everything that he had been working for was finally coming to fruition. While the human nations of the Eastern Kingdoms were not committing their full forces to the campaign against the Primals, Dalaran, Eerie Peak, and surprisingly Quelthalas had contributed quite a bit. The opening hours of the campaign had been beautiful to watch, as the Alliance and the Night Elves exploited their air superiority to maximum effect. Nerebian flyers, hippogriff riders, griffin riders, Dragonhawk riders, and dragons had obliterated the enemy defenses through a deadly combination of dragonfire, magic, and explosives. Naturally, the primals attempted to respond by sending swarms of flying creatures that they had infected or launching massive vines into the sky to kill its airborne attackers. Unfortunately for them, it had taken the primals far too long to gather a large enough swarm from across their territory to meaningfully threaten the Alliance forces. By the time the Alliance air forces were forced to retreat, the path to Elder Thalas had been cleansed of as much corrupted plant life as possible. The largest of the primals had either been burned to ash or blown to pieces, but ground forces would still need to clear out numerous smaller fell plant creatures. From that point, the Night Elves and the Alliance proceeded with a relatively simple plan. It was decided that they would need a proper stronghold in Feralas from which they could attack the Primals for logistical reasons. So, their first objective would be to secure Eldrathalas. Like most highborn cities, Eldrathalas was built directly over the most powerful ley line in the region and would thus allow their mages to access an abundant source of magic. Tarunda insisted that their armies should advance separately, citing an unfamiliarity with the tactics and formation styles of the Alliance. It was a surprisingly diplomatic way of saying that the Night Elves didn't want outsiders getting in their way. The Night Elves had agreed to join forces with the Alliance quickly only due to the seriousness of the situation. Krivax was under no illusion that they had suddenly become more tolerant overnight. Still, the Cenarian Circle had offered several of their druids to help the Alliance advance. Looking at the scene in front of him now, Krivax wasn't exactly sure how necessary their help actually was. Through the scrying crystal, Krivax watched as the guardians of Nereb tore through the fell corrupted creatures with ferocious efficiency. Their carapaces shone brightly with the light, offering inspiration to the combined Alliance and Tauren forces who followed in their wake. Anubakan himself served as the spearhead of the offensive, the light emanating from him causing many of the more intelligent primals to shrink back. His razor-sharp limbs destroyed those foolish enough to stand in the path of the column of troops. Several members of the Blue Dragon flight flew to the sides of the advancing army, taking advantage of the protection they offered to destroy any of the corrupted vines or plant life attempting to encroach on them. 
Whenever the Primals attempted to send their flight-capable forces toward the dragons, a combination of magic and gunfire would immediately blow them out of the sky. Even as they advanced for hours through enemy territory, Torin shamans worked alongside priests from the Church of the Holy Light to heal wounds and keep the army moving. Krivax knew without a doubt that this kind of advance would have been impossible for any singular power to achieve on its own. Cooperation had allowed them to take advantage of each faction's unique strength and respond to the Burning Legion's plot with unprecedented force. Seeing this realization of his vision was something that Krivax found deeply satisfying. It's a shame that we can't join them, said Masruk, his disappointed voice pulling Krivax out of his thoughts. That fight looks like a good one. You know, there wasn't anything stopping you from joining Anubakan, Krivax said with amusement, glancing down at his friend. I doubt that my part in the plan will be as entertaining for a battle maniac like you. At first, Krivax had expected that he would be sent to the front lines to either help push back the primals or help heal the injured, but it had been decided that he would be deployed in his role as a diplomat. After all, somebody needed to go into Eldrathalas and make contact with the Highborn, and Krivax was the least likely to get himself killed trying. Krivax could have still potentially followed along on the front lines, but their delegation needed to be in decent condition once they entered Eldrathalas rather than have been fighting for hours. He would be fine, but the rest of the delegation would be completely exhausted. This was why Krivax was currently waiting in an alliance camp alongside his personal guards, his traveling companions, and several mages from Quelthalas. Once the Alliance military secured a safe location near the barrier surrounding Eldrathalas, their group would be teleported in, and the Magisters would help create an opening into the city. After which, their group would do everything they could to convince the Elves to work alongside the Alliance. Unfortunately, Krivax knew a lot less about the Highborn in Eldrathalas than he wished. Their city must have been destroyed at some point in the original timeline, because Krivax remembered this place as being overrun by ogres and renamed Dire Maul. Recognizing that he needed more information, Krivax turned to the High Elf delegation and decided to ask them. Even if Quelthalas was on the other side of the ocean, the High Elves still had more in common with the Elves of this city than anyone else since both of their societies were built on arcane magic. Is there any news on why the Highborn have refused to leave their city? Krivax asked Virisa. Since she knew him better than any other high elf and was a member of a very influential family, Virisa had been designated the leader of their delegation. If we're going to convince these elves to help us, then I need to know as much as I can. Virisa traded an unsure look with the other high elves before answering. It's hard to say, Krivax. There doesn't seem to be anything blocking the ley lines or making it impossible for them to leave the city. The fact that they haven't left despite their defenses being nearly overrun makes little sense. It was good to hear that there wasn't anything wrong with the ley lines, but that didn't answer his question. Do we have any ideas at all? Krivax asked hopefully. I really don't want to go in there completely blind if I can help it. Our current theory is that their city possesses a font of magic that they cannot abandon, Virisa offered hesitantly. If these highborn are anything like us, then their people would be incapable of sustaining themselves in the long term without a source of magic. I couldn't imagine how our people would react if they were forced to leave behind the sunwell. However, any competent maid should be able to sense such a font of power from miles away. That theory made sense to Krivax. He had always known that High Elves had an innate addiction to arcane magic, but traveling with Virisa for the past few months had made him realize exactly how bad the situation was. The only reason that Virisa hadn't turned into deformed and insane creature after being away from the Sunwell for so long was due to expensive mana crystals provided by her kingdom. These crystals, alongside frequent donations of arcane magic from her husband, provided Virisa with the magic that she needed to sustain herself. Krivax knew from his meta-knowledge that the Night Elves and the Naga were the only races descended from the Highborn who weren't hopelessly addicted to arcane magic, and only because they converted to using nature and void magic respectively. That makes sense, Krivax said after a moment of thought. These guys would need a large source of arcane magic if they want to survive. 
If that does turn out to be the case, then is Quothalas willing to offer them refuge? Krivax needed to know now what kind of bargaining chips he could offer. Fortunately, Virisa immediately nodded in agreement. That won't be a problem. Our people sympathize with the highborn. We know what it's like to lose everything and start anew. We'll provide them with refuge and access to a stable source of magic, if need be. Krivax let out a sigh of relief. That was at least one problem that he didn't need to worry about. For the next few hours, Krivax watched as the alliance drew ever closer to the boundary of Eldrathalas. The primals were steadily drawing forces away from their siege to counter the alliance, which was slowing the advance down heavily. The progress was brutal and grinding, but they eventually managed to get close enough to Eldrathalas. I think that's close enough, Krivax announced loudly, glancing toward the high elf mages. Please open a portal to the front lines so that we can begin making our way through the barrier. Really? Are you sure about this, Vizier Krivax? One mages asked with surprise. The front lines are still very active. It may be safer to wait for the conflict to subside a bit. It's safe enough, I think we should be fine, Krivax assured them. Besides, they look like they could use some help. You've all made it clear that I'm not the only one who's tired of sitting back safe while everyone else is fighting for their lives. The sooner that we secure the cooperation of Eldrathalas, the more lives we'll be able to save. Well thank goodness for that, Trixie spoke up, stretching as she stood from where she had been sitting. I was starting to think I'd have to sit here forever. I get that you're some important person nowadays, but wars aren't supposed to be this boring, Krivax. There was an immediate chorus of agreement from the others, who were indeed looking at the ongoing conflict with a mixture of impatience and concern. After everyone spent a few minutes preparing for themselves for battle, the mages quickly began casting their spell, and a shimmering portal soon sprang into life in the center of the Alliance camp. Watch each other's backs, everyone. Krivax said as his guards strode through the portal first to secure the other side. Once we've secured the area, our goal is to immediately break through into Eldrathalas. As soon as he stepped through the portal, Krivax immediately realized that the battlefield was far more chaotic than it had looked from the Alliance camp. The first thing Krivax noticed was the acrid scent of burnt vegetation and the sight of thick, cloying smoke surrounding them. A cacophony of battle cries, exploding magic, and the roars of angry dragons filled the air. Krivax immediately released his golem from the spatial bag and directed it to assist a Nuba Khan with the multiple Genesaurs attacking the Nerebian paladin. After that, Krivax put most of his focus on helping as much as he could to turn the tide of battle, throwing large streams of life-infused flames across the battlefield that mended wounds and burned primals to ash. The much-needed reinforcements brought by their arrival quickly bolstered the morale of the Alliance forces. Their group was small, but contained many powerful individuals who could significantly influence the battle. While Krivax and his companions fought, the High Elf Mages were hard at work trying to create an opening in the barrier surrounding Eldrathalas. Creating a small opening in a barrier without destroying the entire thing was rather delicate work, so Krivax did his best to ensure that no primals would disturb them. It was difficult work when every random plant and infested wildlife was trying to kill them. Masruk in particular helped them fend off the creatures for quite a while, constantly jumping spear first between enemies with powerful flaps of his wings, his enhancements preventing him from growing tired. Krivax was amazed at his friend's incredible awareness as he seemed to effortlessly dodge away from primal attacks and move swiftly through the battlefield. Azul Nerub had not been stingy when supplying him with equipment, so each swipe of his enchanted spear tore through the bark skin of a primal, sending splinters flying through the air. Krivax soon lost himself to the chaos of the battlefield until, after what felt like an eternity, a triumphant cheer erupted from the group of high elf mages. Their combined efforts had finally resulted in a small, shimmering hole in the protective barrier. Krivax hesitated for a moment as he looked around the battlefield, but a Nubakan had managed to slay one of the Genesaurs and was quickly regaining control of the battle. There were still several infested dragons and other powerful creatures threatening the alliance, but their group had already helped change the tide. 
Krivax momentarily considered leaving behind his golem to help out, but decided against it. He doubted that he'd get into a serious fight while in Eldrathalas, but it was better to be safe than sorry. Besides, it would probably be helpful as a show of force if the highborn were uncooperative. Once he returned the golem to its spatial bag, Krivax signaled to the rest of his group and they made their way through the barrier and into Eldrathalas. Krivax took a moment to ensure everyone had crossed over, and then with a glance and a nod from the high elf mages the breach in the barrier sealed up behind them. Almost immediately, the sound of the battle was cut off and replaced by an eerie silence that was broken only by the sound of heavy breathing. Woo! Now that's a way to get the blood pumping, Trixie panted as she leaned against her shrink ray, her eyes wide with a mixture of exhaustion and adrenaline. Yes, it was, Krivax agreed, allowing everyone only a few moments to catch their breaths before he urged them to move on. We have to get going. Every moment that we waste is another that our people are fighting against an inexhaustible swarm of monsters. We have to convince the highborn to allow them to use this city as a stronghold. Once they were ready, the delegation cautiously began to make their way through the outskirts of Eldrathalas and into the city proper. It likely wouldn't be long before the highborn noticed the breach in their barrier and sent a team to go investigate, so Krivax took the opportunity to get a good look at the city itself while he waited. Eldrathalas was a strange city, simultaneously grand and degraded, with several grandiose marble pillared buildings along the outskirts covered in vines and moss. The inner buildings were obviously well maintained, but the city's population must have been significantly smaller than it was before the sundering. The vast majority of the outer districts had been left abandoned to be reclaimed by the wilderness. It gave Eldrathalas an almost surreal beauty, a once powerful city desperately clinging to the faded reminder of a glorious past. Their delegation moved through what seemed to be a long abandoned residential district. Imposing mansions lined the path, their edifice a mix of ivy-covered stone and gnarled roots that had grown into the infrastructure over the centuries. After a few minutes of walking, Krivax detected someone approaching them from deeper in the city. Our welcoming party is on their way, Krivax announced to the delegation. Don't make any hostile moves, but be sure to stay on your guard. We have no idea how these people will react to us. If these elves were anything like all of the others that Krivax had met over the years, then a friendly greeting was likely off the table. If not for the urgency of the situation, then Krivax would have wanted to find a much more diplomatic way to make contact with the highborn than blatantly trespassing in their city. They didn't have to wait long before a group of highborn appeared past the corner of a ruined building with weapons raised high, only to stumble and gawk once they spotted the delegation. Given that none of them had ever seen a Nerebian, their reactions weren't particularly surprising. Krivax in particular was the focus of most of their fearful stares, so he decided to do what he always did in these kinds of situations and greet them as friendly as he could. Hello, there? Krivax called out in the language of the night elves, which should still be intelligible to these highborn. My name is Krivax, Ambassador. Krivax sputtered in shock as a fireball splashed harmlessly against his face. The sudden attack left the delegation momentarily stunned, until the shock passed and everyone began shouting and reaching for weapons. Krivax hurried to wave them down before anyone could retaliate. Everyone calm down, I'm not harmed. We're here to make friends, not enemies. Krivax yelled in common over the cacophony of angry shouts. He was grateful that the highborn hadn't chosen to throw something more damaging to him than fire. Once he was sure that the delegation wasn't going to attack the people who they were here to make contact with, Krivax turned back to the highborn and spoke again in Kaldoi. As I was saying, I am Krivax, an ambassador currently representing the Alliance. We are here because we wish to work with your people to fight the creatures attacking your city. What manner of beast are you? asked one of the highborn, looking up at him incredulously. How did you enter our city? Krivax barely held back a sigh as he answered. I'm a Nerebian, a race of people who are members of the Alliance, a military coalition of various nations and races united for a common cause. We were able to pass through your barrier with the assistance of the Kuldoi. Krivax gestured to the High Elves next to him and saw the Highborn slightly relax. 
It seemed that pointing out that the scary spider people were in the company of elves had been enough to reassure the highborn that they weren't going to be immediately attacked. The highborn took a moment to discuss amongst themselves, their eyes flickering between the various members of the delegation, before the most finely dressed among them stepped forward. I am Prince Tortheldrin, ruler of Elder Thalas, announced the apparent leader of the highborn, his voice holding an air of pridefulness and caution. Am I to understand that you are affiliated with the strange creatures fighting the corrupted plant life attacking our city? Krivax briefly wondered why the man was a prince instead of a king, but quickly pushed those thoughts away as he answered with a respectful bow. That's correct, Prince Tortheldrin. Those strange creatures you speak of are members of the alliance fighting alongside the Toren tribes, the Kaldoi, and the dragonflights against a threat we believe to have been wrought by the Burning Legion. Understanding that time was of the essence, Krivax immediately laid out the entirety of the situation. He could already tell that this prince was the kind of person to be more difficult to those he perceived as weak, so he made sure to put forward special emphasis when he mentioned the dragons. He had learned by now that diplomacy on Azeroth was much smoother when the other party knew that you weren't to be messed with. Sure enough, the arrogance on Prince Tortheldrin's face slowly gave way to caution. We had suspicions that these abominations were affiliated with the Burning Legion. Their fell magic is unmistakable, but how do we know that you aren't enemies sent by the Legion to infiltrate our great city, creature? The Legion is no stranger to using such trickery. Great city. Nobody cares enough about these rundown ruins to go through all that effort, Krivax thought to himself. Krivax spent the next few minutes reassuring the highborn that they weren't affiliated with the Burning Legion, diplomatically pointing out that their barrier wasn't strong enough to keep out the alliance, so such deception would be unnecessary. The highborn were just as stuck up and full of themselves as Krivax had expected, but there was a distinct and profound weariness that seemed to hang over the elves. As much as the prince didn't want to be seen as undercutting his own authority to outsiders, Krivax could see the desperation among the highborn giving way to reluctant hope. Once the conversation calmed down a bit, and the prince was no longer accusing them of secretly being demons, Krivax decided to move the conversation onto more important topics. He didn't want to directly ask the highborn why they were refusing to evacuate their city, because that would imply the unpalatable truth that they were too weak to defend it. So, Krivax instead chose to offer help. I intend no offense, Prince Tortheldrin, but there are some among my delegation who insist I make this offer, Krivax said as he gestured toward the high elves. The Kuldoi would like to offer your civilians refugee while we face this crisis. Please rest assured, Quelthalus possesses a font of magic capable of easily sustaining your people. As soon as he was done speaking, Krivax knew that he had made the correct decision. The highborn immediately broke out into excited chatter, hope and relief clearly visible on their expressions. Even Prince Tortheldrin was staring at the high elves with desperate desire. W. We are perfectly capable of providing for our own people, but it may be for the best if we accept your gracious offer, Prince Tortheldrin said with a conceding tone, as if he was doing them a great favor. Krivax let out a sigh of relief. The prince could act as arrogant as he liked so long as he agreed to cooperate with the alliance. It was obvious now that the highborn valued access to the Sunwell more than their pride, and that was good enough for Krivax. Just as he was about to respond, Krivax flinched as an ear-shattering roar echoed from within Elder Thalas, silencing all conversation and causing the buildings to shudder. Prince Tor the Ledrin's face immediately grew pale before becoming red with rage as drew his sword and whirled on them. Deceivers! I knew this farce was too good to be true. How dare you release the demon on which my people rely to sustain themselves? The prince's accusation was first met with confusion by the delegation, before they suddenly understood and that feeling became one of horror. You fools feed on a demon. Have you completely lost your minds? Virisa shouted, her incredulous voice cutting through the panicked whispers of the highborn. How easy it must be for you to judge us, Prince Tortheldrin haughtily snapped back, venom dripping from every word. Have you ever felt the desperate hunger for magic as you starve? The thirst that can never be sated? We did what we had to in order to survive. Before anyone could react, 
Another hate filled roar echoed throughout the city. We don't have time for this, Krivax said, desperately hoping that the highborn would see sense. Please, allow us to help you fight off this demon. The Burning Legion is the mutual enemy of every being on Azeroth. Imulthar has not escaped his bindings once in the many millennia that he has been bound and remained well hidden from the outside world, Prince Tulfeldrin spat, palms white as he gripped his sword. Am I supposed to believe it a coincidence that it does so the very moment that you invade our city, outsiders? Do you think I'm a fool? Of course not, Krivax lied as he placated the angry prince. In fact, I also doubt that this is a coincidence. We have reason to believe that the Burning Legion sent a dreadlord to oversee the creatures attacking your city. If that is the case, then the demon was most likely freed to sow chaos among us and kill the brave soldiers defending Eldrathalas. Krivax had no idea if that was true, but it seemed like the most plausible explanation for what actually happened. There was a moment of stunned silence as the highborn pondered his words and talked among themselves. The arrogant prince didn't seem any less furious, but one of his advisers, an older man by the name of Magister Calendris, seemed to be arguing in their favor and was slowly getting through to the prince. If Krivax had to guess, the advisor was likely reminding the prince about how exhausted their own forces must be after fighting off the primals for weeks. Given how dangerous a demon capable of sustaining a highborn city for millennia must be, it was unlikely that they were in a position to turn down assistance. After a tense few moments, Prince Tultheldrin finally sheathed his weapon. Very well, Ambassador Krivax, he began, sounding as if every word was being physically ripped from him. Your assistance in dealing with the demon would be highly appreciated. But be warned, if you betray us in this time of great danger, no I will personally remove your head and claim it as a trophy. Krivax wasn't particularly concerned. This wasn't the first time that his life had been threatened. At this point, he was starting to consider it a staple of elvish diplomacy. Understood, Prince Tultheldrin. We wouldn't dream of crossing you, Krivax said, hoping to deflate the tension in the air. The prince gave a curt nod before turning to his guards and giving orders. After a few moments of preparation, Tultheldrin began leading them toward the western portion of Eldrathalas where the sounds of screams and battle were the loudest. As they delved deeper into the city, Krivax noticed the buildings becoming more immaculate and less overtaken by nature. The grandeur of the highborns past was still evident, albeit faded by time. The sounds of the demons' roars gradually grew louder, and it wasn't long before Krivax managed to get his first look at the creature. The demon had possessed a pair of cyclopean heads with large, dripping maws attached to a muscular body that vaguely resembled a canine's. There were several hateful tentacled eyes protruding from the demon's back, each looking different directions as the monster searched the city for more prey. It was a horrifying sight, made worse by the fact that the demon was more than twenty feet tall and bulkier than most spider lords. How is this possible? The demon should still be drained yelled Prince Tortheldrin, staring at the monster in utter disbelief. Whoever freed the demon must have given it a source of fell magic before letting it loose on the city, said Magister Calendris. It's far too powerful, your highness. Even if we can kill it with the assistance of the outsiders, too many of your subjects will be killed during the fight. We must return it to its prison and drain its power. Krivax focused on the demonic beast and had to admit that the man had a point. He was confident that they could take down the demon with enough effort, but that kind of fight in the middle of a populated urban area would inevitably lead to heavy casualties. Luring it back to its prison was a sensible decision, so long as they could actually activate the containment measures once it was inside. Do you know how damaged the prison is? Krivax asked hurriedly, his eyes still glued on the snarling beast as it tore through the highborn desperately trying to fend it off. It seems unlikely that the Dreadlord would leave the spells containing the demon operational after going through the effort to free it. We took containment procedures regarding the demon very seriously, Magister Calendris assured him. Even if the main pylons powering the prison were sabotaged, there are many contingency measures in place that could be activated by those well versed in the arcane. Still, it would be wise of us to inspect the prison's condition before moving forward with the plan. 
it should only take us a few moments, and will inform us on the best strategy to engage the demon. Krivax considered the proposal for several moments. It seemed like a reasonable plan if what Magister Calendris said was right, and he had no reason to believe otherwise. Still, he didn't really like leaving the demon to rampage unopposed and briefly considered splitting up the group, sending some of the mages to investigate the prison while the rest of them distracted the demon. Unfortunately, he didn't fully trust the highborn not to do anything stupid. They were quite obviously more than a little crazy if they had spent the past several millennia sipping on demon juice in their isolated city. No, it's best if we stick together and get this done as quickly as possible, Krivax thought ruefully. I can't afford to hesitate any longer. Agreed. We'll inspect the prison and ensure its readiness before engaging the demon, but we have to move swiftly. Prince Tortheldron nodded to Krivax solemnly before turning to his advisor. Magister Calendris, lead the way. Krivax, alongside the delegation and the prince's retinue, followed Magister Calendris toward the demon's prison. As they passed over the highborn corpses that the creature had left in its wake, Krivax noted that the prison was tellingly close to the wealthier parts of the city. The highborn aristocrats must have been severely addicted to the demon's magic if they were so willing to risk their own safely. Eventually, they made their way into a tunnel that led deep into the earth, the magical enchantments imbued into the walls producing a soft glow to light their path. It was eerily quiet, a stark contrast to the chaos and destruction that they could still distantly hear from above. The tunnel opened up into a cavernous circular chamber, the remnants of intricate arcane glyphs etched into the stone floor, and massive arcane pylons positioned around the perimeter. In the center of the chamber was a smaller circular area contaminated with residual fell energy where the demon had once been contained. Magister Calendris and the rest of the mages immediately began investigating the damaged pylons as their prince stayed behind to glare impotently at the destroyed prison. Krivax didn't know all that much about arcane pylons, so he decided to instead make his way deeper into the chamber and study the containment spells themselves. It didn't take long for him to realize that Magister Calendris hadn't exaggerated their contingencies. Aside from the central barrier, which had been quite obviously sabotaged, there were also several layers of redundant barriers throughout the chamber ready to be activated so long as the pylons were repaired or an alternative source of magic was provided. Although they were weaker than the central barrier, they would last more than long enough. Soon, Krivax lost himself to his thoughts as he began to think over the best way to bring the demon back to the chamber. He didn't know how intelligent the creature was, but it almost certainly wouldn't want to return to the room in which it had been trapped for millennia. We'll just have to lure it as much as possible and then force it the rest of the way. My golem should be strong enough to herd the thing here so long as I have a bit of help. Oh, maybe we can make use of portals. It'll be a bit difficult with the ambient mana, but Ronin is fairly skilled with spatial magic. The barriers are designed to activate quickly, so we just need to get it here for a few mom. Krivax. Krivax was violently pulled from his thoughts as he was tackled to the side and felt heat for the first time since Alexstrasza empowered him. It took a moment for him to realize that Masruk had pushed him away from an inferno of bright green fell fire that had completely engulfed the spot where he had just been standing. Krivax looked up and saw another wave of fell fire threatening to consume them and instantly conjured a barrier of arcane magic that only barely held off the assault. Once the fire subsided, he hurried to help Masruk up and they both turned to see what had attacked them. Krivax immediately felt his heart drop as he saw that the chamber's defenses had been activated and he and Masruk had been neatly separated from the rest of the delegation by a shimmering arcane barrier. He could see several members of the delegation attempting to destroy the barrier while the rest fended off an ambush from various demons. However, none of the demons on the other side of the barrier were as dangerous as the demon that Krivax and Masruk were now trapped with. Greetings. I am known as Dethirok, and I must commend you, mortal, said the dreadlord, a cruel smirk curling his lips as he shed the form of Magister Calendris. The dreadlord was far fatter than Krivax had expected, his stomach bloated and neck filled with large jowls. Strangely, it didn't make the demon any less intimidating. 
You did not make this easy to arrange. It took quite a bit of planning. Unfortunately for you, I am far too. Suddenly, Krivax faintly sensed an unfamiliar presence rooting through his mind. Krivax immediately attempted to impale the dreadlord on a spike of stone that erupted beneath his feet, which was quickly destroyed with a laugh and swift stomp of the demon's hoof. The demon moved far faster than his appearance would suggest. Fortunately, Krivax had already successfully reinforced his mental shields as much as possible while the dreadlord was distracted. How sensitive! You noticed me quicker than expected, D. Theorox said with a derisive chuckle. Still, you won't be able to stop me from ripping every single secret out of your mind for very long. From what I've already seen, I was right to single you out. What an unusual creature you are. Krivax had barely enough time to panic at what the Dreadlord might have seen before the demon launched a fresh barrage of spells in their direction and he and Masruk were forced to fight for their lives. Krivax let out a gasp of relief as he and Masruk ducked behind his golem to avoid the Theorox barrage of spells. This is bad, really really bad. Taking advantage of this short reprieve, Krivax attempted to teleport himself and Masruk to the other side of the arcane barrier that was trapping them in with a dreadlord. Unfortunately, this failed to produce any results as the highborn countermeasures prevented the spell from taking hold. The magical shimmering barrier reminded him greatly of the magic that the Kirin Tor used to lock people up in the violet hold. Krivax, behind us. Krivax didn't hesitate raising a wall of stone from the ground behind them which was immediately struck by a wave of shadow magic that crashed against it. It only took a few moments for the stone wall to be destroyed, but the golem had already managed to put itself between them and the dreadlord. Did he teleport? No. He conjured an illusion at his previous location and moved while we were distracted. Dethyrok must know how dangerous the golem is at close range, so intends to attack us from afar until he gets a lucky hit. Although Krivax was confident of his own strength, Dethyrok was a demon who had been involved in countless invasions and was a very powerful mage. Even if Krivax probably had an advantage in pure power, which wasn't guaranteed, the Dreadlord had so much more experience than him that it was ridiculous. Stop. Don't panic. I just need to calm down and think, like Hadix taught me. Krivax's mind raced as he struggled to come up with a plan that would get him and Masruk out of this alive. He knew that it likely wouldn't be long before D. Theorok figured out a way to separate them from the safety of the golem. There's a small chance that I could kill D. Theorok if I used every single trick up my sleeve. But I can't afford to take that risk. Any demon that died on Azeroth would eventually reform within the Twisting Nether, allowing them to share everything they knew with the Burning Legion. Only destruction of the soul, something that was currently well beyond his abilities, could prevent the Dreadlord from returning back. Even now, Krivax was pushing back against a mental assault as D. Theorok attempted to rummage through his mind. Krivax was confident that he'd hidden his most dangerous secrets in the deepest parts of his mind, but there was no telling what D. Theorok had already managed to find. No. Who knows what would happen if he was allowed to escape? I have to try to capture D. Theorok alive. It took a moment of consideration for Krivax to realize that he needed to escape the highborn prison containing him by any means necessary. Capturing D. Theorok wasn't something he and Masruk could do alone, but was potentially possible with some assistance. But how? Krivax glanced toward the arcane pylons on the other side of the barrier, but that each of them were protected by powerful shields. D. Theorok was obviously confident that he could defeat them before the delegation managed to destroy the pylons, and Krivax had no reason to second-guess his assessment. He had a few potent elixirs and several artifacts in his spatial bag that he'd prepared for emergencies, but nothing that would be immediately helpful. No, there's only one spell that I know which could destroy this barrier, but I doubt D. Theorok would give me the chance to cast it. Before he could come up with a real plan, Krivax and Masruk were forced to jump away from the golem in opposite directions as a pillar of fell fire erupted under their feet. Masruk! Drink the potion! Krivax yelled as he retrieved a flask from his spatial bag and tossed it to his friend. Trusting him completely, 
Masrug gulped down the potion and promptly vanished from view as the invisibility potion took hold. That should be enough to keep Masrug hidden for the next thirty seconds as long as I keep the demon occupied. Is this your plan, mortal? To protect your weaker companion by hiding him and fighting me alone? Dithirok chuckled, his eyes gleaming with mockery. How selfless. Krivax had no interest in bantering with the demon and immediately launched an inferno across the room even as he began casting another spell. When the inferno hit Dithirok only to reveal him as an illusion, Krivax wasn't surprised. Instead, he calmly finished his spell and felt a hint of satisfaction when a barrage of arcane missiles flew unerringly towards the dreadlord's real location. Dithirok was forced back into visibility as he dispelled the attack with a wave of his hands, moments before it hit him. It wasn't easy to keep track of the dreadlord, but he was just barely able to do so by staying focused on the demon's foul life energy. Annoying gnats. Dithirok snarled, even as he swung a clawed hand wreathed in fell fire at the seemingly empty space behind him. Krivax heard Masruk grunt in pain as the flame grazed him. The invisibility potion instantly faded to reveal Masruk bleeding from a wound in his side, even as he buried his spear in the demon's leg. Luckily, his best friend had escaped the worst by dodging out of the way by sensing Dithirok's movements with his antennae. I don't need protection, Masruk growled out, voice more angry than Krivax had ever heard as pulled his spear free in a shower of fell green blood. Dithirok hissed in pain before furiously stomping the floor with one of his massive hooves, causing fellfire to blast out in all directions and sending Masruk flying to the other side of the chamber. Krivax felt his heart skip a beat watching his friend being injured, but he could still sense Masruk's strong life energy and knew that he wasn't dead. Still, Krivax swore to himself that he would make the dreadlord regret what he had just done. Glaring at Dithirok with fury, Krivax summoned several walls of fire around the demon and ordered his golem to charge the creature. Although the dreadlord had successfully trapped him and Masruk, those same restrictions applied to Dithirok as well, and Krivax intended to take full advantage. With his legs still injured, now was the perfect time to box Dithirok in and see exactly how well his golem stacked up against Anathrism. Dithirok unleashed a stream of fell fire at the golem so hot that it melted the floor around it but the massive silk construct wasn't perturbed as it smashed into the demon and pushed him all the way into the arcane barrier. Krivax could tell that the demon was very strong as he struggled against his golem's grip, but the Nathrism had never been primarily physical fighters. Dithirok's blood spilled as Krivax and his golem pressed their attack. A part of Krivax rejoiced at the sight, but the rest of him felt a growing sense of foreboding as he saw the grim focus on Dithirok's face. Krivax was certain that he was giving the demon a harder fight than he'd expected, but none of Dithirok's wounds were particularly grievous, and his eyes were shining with a malevolence that sent chills down his spine. The dreadlord had lost his smug smirk, and was no longer taking this fight lightly. Krivax attempted to cast a geomancy spell that would have turned the stone beneath Dithirok's feet into mud, only to wince in pain as the bloated demon counterspelled his magic with a dismissive flick of his wrist while dodging the golem's onslaught. A wave of shadow magic crashed into Krivax, eating away at his flesh and sending him sprawling on the ground. Even as Krivax gasped in pain and enveloped himself in life-infused flames to heal his injuries, Dithirok kicked off the arcane barrier with one of his hooves and launched himself over the golem with a beat of his powerful wings. Moments later, Dithirok landed right in front of Krivax and swung a clawed hand at him that tore through his side and knocked him back several feet. Krivax attempted to heal himself and get back to his feet, but was sent rolling by another blow from Dithirok that broke one of his legs. Pathetic. Do you think a hint of borrowed power makes you strong? Dithirok snarled as he stomped forward, casting a spell that repelled the inferno that Krivax summoned under his feet. Compared to me, you are an infant. One who only remains alive due to the secrets he holds in his me, Arg. Dithirok was cut off as Masruk emerged from the flames, exploiting the demon's distraction and obscured vision to thrust his spear toward the demon. Dithirok's reaction was quick enough to avoid being impaled through the chest, but Masruk's enchanted spear still pierced through one of his wings. 
De Thierock responded with a brutal counterattack that slammed Masrut to the ground, but was unable to follow up as Krivax's golem barreled into his side. Suddenly, De Thierock was pinned down and besieged on all sides as Masrut, healed by Krivax's flames, jumped back into the fight. The dreadlord still didn't look like he was going down any time soon as he easily managed to withstand all of their attacks, but this gave Krivax a crucial opportunity. Masrut, hold him off for just a few moments, Krivax yelled as he threw a flask from his spatial bag at the dreadlord and immediately began casting the one spell Hadix had taught him that could free them. Dethyrok roared in indignation, struggling under the weight of the golem attempting to crush him as the flask shattered and covered the dreadlord in a cloud of chilling frost that hampered his movements. Masrup didn't hesitate to take advantage of the demon's newfound sluggishness, lashing out with his spear in a whirlwind of attacks that prevented Dethyrok from turning his attention to Krivax. Krivax focused all of his attention on casting the spell, fully trusting Masrup and his golem to protect him from retaliation. He intended to prove to Dethyrok just how much the Dreadlord had underestimated him. Krivax could tell that the demon was attempting to figure out what spell he was casting, but he knew that was impossible. After all, this was a spell that had been personally created by Hadix and had only been taught to Krivax. The fight between Dethyrok, Masruk, and the Golem grew increasingly desperate as Krivax continued his spellcasting. Masruk sustained several wounds as he did everything he could to keep the demon at bay, even at times jumping in front of a spell and flaring his wings to prevent it from interrupting Krivax. Even the golem was beginning to show signs of damage, as threads of silk hung from its body and one of its arms had been torn from its body in a furious blast of fell fire. Still, they managed to buy Krivax the time that he needed. The spell that Krivax casted would be immediately familiar to anyone who had been presenting during Hadix's very public duel in Dalaran with Arcanist Flame Trail. Immediately after he finished casting, a web-shaped dome of arcane magic manifested around the chamber and expanded outward into the arcane barrier trapping them. Soon afterward, the barrier began to shatter and crack like glass as pieces of it were forcefully pulled into the web. The delegation, which had successfully managed to kill the demons which had ambushed them, immediately renewed their assault on the barrier in an attempt to bring it down faster. Krivax felt a wave of intense relief watch over him as he watched the spell take hold. He had asked Hadix how to cast this spell the very moment that he'd seen it, but it had taken him years and constant effort to actually learn how to cast it. This was the first time he'd actually used it in a real fight. Dethyrok stared up at the collapsing barrier in disbelief for several moments before he met Krivax's gaze, his eyes full of fury. Before anyone could respond, Dethyrok took advantage of the barrier's destruction to teleport several feet away from Masruk and the Golem before throwing a massive ball of fell fire at the delegation. A few of the mages were able to conjure shields to protect themselves, but many of them weren't ready to withstand an attack from a furious dreadlord. As the sound of screams filled the chamber, Krivax couldn't help but look helplessly on at the delegation, only to realize that Dethyrok had disappeared when he had been distracted. No. Fuck. I can't let him escape. Knowing that not even a dreadlord could instantly teleport more than a few feet, Krivax focused all of his attention on the surrounding life energy and sensed Dethyrok fleeing deeper into Elder Thalas from a side entrance. No. He's not fleeing. He's going to meet up with a giant demon attacking the city. Although this was good news for Krivax, in the sense that he still had a chance of capturing Dethyrok alive, it was bad news for everyone else involved. The two demons working together would be many times more dangerous once they were working together, with them compensating for each other's weaknesses. Krivax had a feeling that his golem would be far less effective against a giant like Imanthal than it was against a spellcaster like Dethyrok. In addition, Dethyrok was now free to teleport as much as he wished in battle. Coupled with his illusions and invisibility, it would be nearly impossible to pin him down like Masruk and the golem had done before. On the other hand, Krivax now had a whole lot more help he could call on. Krivax hurried over to the delegation and healed most of their serious wounds. His fight with Dethyrok had drained him of both his mana and life energy, so he needed to be careful not to waste what he still had. 
Masruk had made his way back to join him and had regenerated some of the burns and cracks on his carapace. After a moment, the delegation was back in fighting shape and Krivax was greeted to the sight of a furious Prince Tulfeldrin. You! Prince Tulfeldrin's voice echoed around the chamber, his eyes filled with undisguised rage and a hint of madness as he pointed an accusing finger at Krivax. The moment you outsiders stepped into our city, everything fell into chaos. Now my closest advisor is dead and demons are slaughtering my subjects. Krivax took a moment to mourn the fact that Dithyarok hadn't decided to kill and impersonate the prince instead of his advisor. It would have made things much easier for him. Prince Tortheldrin, we understand your anger, Krivax said, trying to placate the prince. But right now, we need to put our differences aside and focus on our common enemy. The demons are threats to us both. There's no telling how thorough Dithyarok was in his sabotage, so we need to regroup with the rest of your forces if we are to fight them back. A city filled with desperate elves like Elder Thalas was prime territory for corruption by the Burning Legion. Dithyarok wouldn't have had to work very hard to convince a few mages desperate for magic to sabotage the wards and help summon a few extra demons into the city. Especially since these crazy elves were already accustomed to feeding on the magic of demons. They needed to act fast if they wanted to save the innocent civilians who were still in danger. Prince Tortheldrin continued to glare furiously at Krivax, his eyes flitting between him, the golem, and the rest of the delegation. Krivax had no doubt that the prince would have done something stupid if he thought he could get away with it, but he seemed to recognize that he had few options. After a moment, the prince's harsh expression softened ever so slightly. Very well. I will cooperate with you for now, but this conversation is not over. Krivax could only nod in response. He didn't particularly care about what Prince Tortheldrin thought of him while Dithyarok was still out there, having seen who knew what in Krivax's head. Obviously, dealing with the Dreadlord was his absolute highest priority. Are you guys ready? Krivax asked, addressing the entire delegation as he returned his golem back to its spatial bag. Yeah. I'm good, big guy, Trixie said as she checked over a recently healed wound in her side. These demons are pretty scary, but nothing we can't handle. A round of agreements followed from the others. After a few moments of preparation, Prince Tortheldrin began leading them down that path Dithyarok had taken toward Imenthal. As they followed the highborn back to the surface, Krivak suddenly sensed someone behind him trying to open telepathic communication with him and turned to see it was Ronin. Krivax, I think it would be best if we sent someone to notify the Alliance of what is happening in this city, Ronin's voice echoed in his mind. They must be made aware of the Burning Legion's activities here, and I don't fully trust these highborn to allow us to leave peacefully once the threat to their city is dealt with. Krivax was very careful to hide his reaction, as it was clear that Prince Tortheldrin would react poorly to more outsiders invading his city. However, he shared Ronin's distrust of the highborn and agreed that it would be a good idea to send for backup. The fact that Dithyarok had not fled the city completely meant that he still had some sort of plan or objective that he was confident in accomplishing. Capturing Krivax for interrogation could be one of those objectives, but Dithyarok would also probably want to do as much damage as possible to Elder Thalas in order to diminish its usefulness to the Alliance. Whatever the case, there were times that strategic objectives were more important than diplomacy. The highborn and their sensibilities were something that could be dealt with later. You and Virisa can go. Get whatever help you can as quickly as possible, Krivax replied mentally to the mage. Split off discreetly from the group once we reach the surface. Ronin nodded subtly, before he and his wife began to lag behind the rest of the group. After a few moments, Krivax lost sight of them as he turned the corner and focused back on the prince, trusting the couple to disappear when the opportunity arrived. As Krivax and the rest of the delegation made their way to the surface, they passed by several grisly scenes of slaughtered highborn mages and their servants. However, Krivax was most worried about the demon corpses among them. It was becoming increasingly likely that Elder Thalas was facing a serious demonic incursion. Once they finally reached the streets of Eldrathalas, they were greeted to the site of absolute chaos. Buildings were ablaze, 
casting a hellish light onto the streets filled with panicked elves and savage demons. The chilling howls of Imenthal echoed through the city, the giant two-headed demon easily visibly as it rampaged through the city, leaving destruction in its wake. Many of the highborn panicked once they caught sight of Krivax and the rest of the delegation, but they gradually settled down as their prince reassured them that the delegation was there to help. It didn't take long for Prince Tulfeldrin to take control of the situation, rallying the scattered guards and organizing them to hunt down the weaker demons terrorizing the city. Fortunately, there seemed to be fewer of the demons than Krivax had expected, likely because Eldrathalas didn't have a large enough font of magic to open a particularly large portal. Amid the chaos, an elf clad in imposing armor approached the prince with a group of soldiers following behind him. Guard Captain Alandian, Prince Tortheldron acknowledged the elf. Report. Your Highness, the city is at threat of being overrun. Many of our mages have been killed, and the rest have shown themselves to be traitors, Captain Alandian reported, his voice grim. Imanthal is rampaging through the city, and we have yet to find a way to stop him. The traitors have occupied the shrine of Eldrathar and are conducting an unknown ritual. There have been reported sightings of a dreadlord, but those reports are yet unconfirmed. Prince Tortheldron was quick to respond after his subordinate finished his report. Take half of our soldiers to deal with the traitorous vermin at the shrine. The rest of us will join me in defending our city. There's no need to avoid killing Imenthal, as these outsiders have promised us a new source of magic. They will also assist us in fighting the demon. Krivax could tell from the prince's disdainful expression that he was hoping for as many of them to die to Imenthal as possible, but he decided not to say anything. Capturing D. Theorok was still his first priority, and he could sense that the dreadlord was sticking near Imenthal. So, that was where he needed to be. Captain Elandian nodded at the prince's orders, immediately barking orders at his subordinates and leading a group of them toward the eastern part of the city. Krivax nodded to the delegation, directing them to follow behind the prince and his soldiers as they made their way toward Imenthal. Although Ronin and Valera were no longer with the delegation, the group still contained a decent amount of high elf magisters, Masruk, and Trixie, alongside his usual guards. Therefore, they were a formidable enough group to help out with the demon. Despite the prince's hostility, none of them wanted to see the innocent citizens of Eldrathalas suffer for it. During their trek toward Imenthal, they came across several rogue demons that were burning buildings and spreading chaos throughout the city. Krivax did what he could to help the highborn against these demons, but he saved most of his strength in preparation for his second confrontation with D. Theorok. He had a feeling that the dreadlord would be ready and waiting for his arrival. Finally, they arrived at the square where Imenthal was causing havoc. Several weaker demons surrounded the two-headed monster as it destroyed buildings and killed fleeing elves. D. Theorok was nowhere to be seen, but Krivax could sense that he was nearby and even feel the dreadlord continue his attempts to rummage through his mind. Stay vigilant. The dreadlord is here, Krivax warned the delegation. He had no doubt that D. Theorok intended to ambush them at their most vulnerable. Before anyone could react, Imenthal turned to them and released a mighty roar that shook the very ground they stood on. Each of its hate-filled eyes was locked directly on the highborn prince, making it clear that the demon recognized the man who had trapped and fed on its magic for millennia. To his credit, Prince Tortheldrin didn't flinch under the monster's gaze and instead ordered his soldiers to attack the demons. It wasn't long before the square became a full-blown battlefield, with elves and demons locked in deadly combat. Imanthal attempted to charge the prince, but its advance was ground to a halt as Krivax's golem engaged the behemoth in a contest of strength. The construct, while not as large as Imanthal, was incredibly sturdy and felt neither fear nor pain. With the golem managing to hold the demon down, the mages present were free to unleash their most powerful spells on the monster, even while Krivax's personal guard skittered up its back and began carving into its flesh. Amid the chaos of the battle, Krivax focused entirely on finding D. Theorok. The battle made it difficult for him to pinpoint the Dreadlord's exact location, but he was certain the demon was nearby. This intense focus was the only reason why he managed to sense the sudden surge of fell coming from a nearby balcony. 
Whirling around, Krivax conjured a barrier just as a stream of green fire descended on him, only to panic when he discovered the fire to be an illusion. Krivax groaned in pain as he was sent crashing through the stone wall of a nearby building, having been struck from behind by an invisible force. Disoriented, he forced himself to stand as he sensed Dethyrox's presence closing in. Both his mind and his body ached with pain, but he knew that the demon wouldn't allow him even a moment's rest. In the next instant, Krivax felt a shift in the air and unleashed a blast of unrefined arcane magic behind himself. His attack was met with resistance, revealing the bloated form of Dethyrox and forcing him back. Krivax couldn't help but wince as he realized that the Dreadlord had managed to heal all of his wounds, most likely by draining the life of any highborn he came across. Humph! You are truly more troublesome than I expected, Dethyrox said with a scowl on his face. Maybe you're just weaker than you believed, Krivax shot back as he took a moment to consider his situation. He glanced toward the destroyed wall only to see a wall of fell fire separating them from the rest of the battlefield. You should have run, while you had the chance. D. Theorok had chosen to ambush him moments after his golem had engaged Imenthal. He could still hear the fight going on outside the building, and knew several people would likely die if he pulled the construct back to help him fight the Dreadlord. He could sense Masrup climbing the side of the building so that he could join the fight but it would take him a few moments to arrive. It would be difficult for him to capture D. Theorok in this situation, but not utterly impossible given that the Dreadlord had no idea that reinforcements would be coming soon. Krivax was confident in his ability to outlast the demon since D. Theorok seemed too interested in reading his memories to fight with lethal intent. The Dreadlord probably believed that he could escape at his leisure using invisibility and teleportation magic. However, Long-distance teleportation took time and concentration to cast, and Krivax could sense the demon wherever he went. All he had to do was wear Dethyrok down until the Alliance arrived and hunt him down when the coward tried to flee. Do you truly believe that I would flee from a mere mortal? Dethyrok sneered, flaring his wings wide. If you were wise, then you would surrender your secrets and swear your loyalty to the Burning Legion. Even if you survive this day— there is nothing but darkness in Azeroth's future. Krivax knew Azeroth's future better than most and knew that it wasn't a happy one, but he'd worked too hard to change things to even consider the demon's offer. Krivax responded to the Dreadlord's offer by creating a cascade of ice spikes that surged toward the demon. Dethyrok didn't hesitate to melt the ice in a blaze of fire, but this merely made it easier for Krivax to create a water elemental behind the Dreadlord that immediately began to assault the demon. Unfortunately, Dethyrok teleported away before the elemental could land a hit, reappearing on the other side of the room and transforming the surrounding debris into a swarm of angry bats that launched themselves at Krivax. The battle remained a stalemate for nearly a minute, with the two of them trading spells back and forth, each trying to gain the upper hand. Krivax gradually found himself being pressured, forced to defend both his body and mind at the same time as his reserves began to run low. Every time that D. Theorok managed to land a hit on Krivax, his concentration on his mental defenses slipped, and the Dreadlord was able to push into his mind just a bit further. Just as Krivax was about to pull back his golem despite the casualties it might cause, he was given a bit of breathing room as Masruk managed to find a way into the building and join the fight. Krivax managed to distract the Dreadlord long enough for Masruk to open a large gash along the demon's bloated stomach. Gah! Die, mortal! Dethyrok roared in rage as he launched Masruk out of a window with a furious blow. Krivax attempted to help his friend, but Dethyrok soon unleashed an onslaught of attacks that he struggled to keep up with. Masruk eventually managed to glide back into the building on his wings, but their combined force was only just enough to keep the Dreadlord at bay. In his fury, Dethyrok hadn't forgotten to continue his assault on Krivax's mind, and he eventually began to wear him down. Dethyrok took many wounds in his reckless attack, but they never seemed to slow him down. Eventually, Krivax felt a sharp pain in his head that was followed by Dethyrok's furious expression morphing into one of surprise. Masruk didn't miss the chance to take advantage of the Dreadlord's momentary distraction and lunged forward, burying his spear in the Dreadlord's gut. 
D. Theorok let out a roar of pain as he staggered backwards, but he quickly pushed through the pain and teleported to the other side of the room. Krivax hurriedly rebuilt his fractured mental defenses as he wondered what the dreadlord might have seen. Even as he dislodged the spear from his stomach, D. Theorok's eyes were filled with interest as he stared at him. Krivax felt a wave of horror wash over him as he looked in the demon's eyes and imagined the potential repercussions if the dreadlord managed to escape with whatever he knew. Just as he was about to resume his assault on D. Theorok in a desperate attempt to, to capture him, all of them froze at the sound of Imanthal releasing an earth-shaking roar before suddenly falling silent. What the hell? Turning all of his senses toward the battlefield, Krivax was able to sense that Imanthal had been killed and the life energy of the smaller demons were beginning to disappear one after the other. Reinforcements? But. I can only sense one person moving between each of the demons, and their life energy feels strange, as if it was somehow corrupted like a demon's. Suddenly realizing exactly who had arrived, Krivax turned his attention back to D. Theorok, only to see the dreadlord's eyes widen in fear as he looked in the direction of the battlefield. Krivax exploited this opening and pulled on every last bit of life-infused flame that he had left and launched it at the dreadlord. D. Theorok screamed in pain as the fire melted his flesh, and the demon promptly fled the building as quickly as he could. Krivax instantly ordered his golem to intercept the wounded dreadlord, hope swelling in his chest as he and Masruk rushed after the demon. It was unlikely that even a spellcaster as skilled as D. Theorok could teleport far away while suffering such severe wounds. Besides, if Imanthal's killer was who he thought it was, then D. Theorok, with his injuries, wouldn't stand a chance against him. As soon as he stepped out of the building, Krivax found himself freezing as he took in the state of the battlefield. Dismembered corpses of demons were strewn across the square, and nearly everyone had stopped fighting and was standing in shocked silence. Imanthal's enormous body lay slain in the middle of the square, large gashes running across the demon's body. Standing amidst the carnage was a male knight elf dressed in dark leather armor, a pair of large warglaves in each of his hands. Two orbs of glowing emerald light shone through the blindfold that covered his eyes, and his skin was covered in tattoos that emanated fell magic. His presence was commanding as it was terrifying, not even the most arrogant of the highborn daring to break the silence. As Krivax studied the blood-soaked battlefield, he couldn't help but think that Illidan's storm rage was every bit as awe-inspiring as he'd expected. Unfortunately, the awe immediately turned to horror as he saw Illidan glance at the fleeing dreadlord and leap toward the demon with blinding speed. Before Krivax could even reach, Illidan had already cut off both of the dreadlord's wings and pinned him to the ground with one of his warglaves. Wait. We need to capture him alive. Krivax yelled at the murderous night elf, hoping desperately that he would listen. He can't be allowed to return to the twisting nether. Krivax let out a sigh of relief as he saw Illidan pause just before he was about to deliver the finishing blow and turn to look at him. Great. Thanks for stopping. Let me do. Krivax's grateful words died in his throat at the sight of D. Theorok intentionally impaling himself on one of Illidan's warglaves. He might have found the utterly dumbfounded expression on the night elf's face amusing if not for the circumstances. No. Krivax yelled as he made his way over to Dreadlord. He attempted for a while to heal the demon's wounds, but it soon became clear that D. Theorok had died nearly instantly. Once he realized this, Krivax couldn't bring himself to care about how everyone was looking at him as he buried his face in his hands. Masruk wordlessly put his hand on his shoulder to comfort him. Although they'd achieved a significant victory by securing Eldrathalas and removing the Theorok from Azeroth, there was no telling what information the Dreadlord might share with the Burning Legion once he reformed. Krivax sincerely doubted that D. Theorok had discovered the truth of his reincarnation, as that was buried in the very deepest and most well-hidden mental shields. It was also impossible for the demon to have taken all of his meta-knowledge, as that was simply too much information to acquire in such a short time. But Krivax still couldn't help but wonder. Just what did the demon manage to learn?